So my name is Priyatam. I work at the Level Money team. Uh, it's been a fairly new, new gig for me. It's about seven or eight months. Uh, it's a great team. So I've had a lot of fun working with them. And this talk will be about uh, caching at the application layer. Uh, it's not something I have worked extensively for a while. So we'll see, uh, we'll see if how, how I could share some of that with you guys. Uh, so Level Money app. Oh, let me just uh, set this up. So Level Money is a, is a platform and an app. Um, it hasn't been around for that long time, but uh, it has been out for like more than two years. So that's, that's not a long time, I, I would say. Um, it has been bought by Capital One, and like most, uh, most apps that you would know, uh, we, have a, we have a classic Android, web, and iOS teams. And uh, the fun part here is that most of it involves in uh, viewing user transactions. And what user transactions are, are essentially when you make a purchase on a credit card or a debit card, you have a, you have a row, right? When you link to your bank account, you have that single row that says this is what happened. So if you combine a million, we have a million downloads, so there are a lot of users. If you combine all of them, and if you look at a synthetic view of them, you actually have millions and millions of transactions. So the key question here is, we're doing all of that at, we're doing uh, querying and filtering and sorting and uh, all of that at the application layer. How complex can that be? So that will be the premise of the talk. Uh, some of the stuff you might be interested to know is this whole app is actually a single monolithic uh, and a single source, 32,000 lines of Clojure code. And I would say this has been my uh, biggest uh, production code base. Uh, we do have about 170 clusters, EC2, clus uh, EC2 instances. So there is a lot of code uh, that is running. Um, but the best part um, is yet to come. Uh, one of the things I've learned by doing, uh, by understanding how uh, cache systems work, uh, both in the libraries and as well as the application, is that there are two fundamental concepts. That is, we're either looking at spatial, that is space-based uh, locality or temporal locality. And uh, I believe that most of the issues we find in application cache kind of falls down into temporal locality. What I mean by that is if you access a data X in a time delta, there is a good chance, uh, if you design your application cache well, that you are going to access the same delta again very soon, uh, within the same delta T, that same uh, cache segment. And I think if you, see, if you look at it this way, it is important to understand that what you're looking at is not compressing or, or optimizing the space, because memory is cheap, right? Cat Storage is cheaper, memory is cheap. What we're optimizing is the concurrent access. What happens between T1 to Tn? I think that is key. Uh, and therefore, I would like to highlight the three things uh, I've learned. Um, in most caches, we, we get to three basic concepts. Uh, I think we should be all familiar with this, right? Uh, but I have a question to ask. Uh, does anyone know which comes first? If you were to design caching, and if you had three, three concepts, which comes first? I guess I cheated. I gave you the answer, right? Uh, so I think invalidation uh, maybe comes first. Maybe I could be wrong, but let's see. So what is invalidation? In a nutshell, I like to explain things for a six-year-old, because I think I'm a six-year-old sometimes. So invalidation is essentially you have concurrent access, either same user uh, trying to access the multiple, like the set of information multiple times, or multiple users are act trying to access that. So the question is, how do you notify? How do you, how do you tell the other person, the other cache set, request, that it is no longer valid? That's essentially invalidation. So that's no longer valid, right? And it's not as easy. It is actually a hard problem. Eviction, on the other hand, is asking a question that comes after that, the fact of invalidation, which is how long do I exist? I, in this case, is a cache segment. Um, so I don't know why this guy is excited, but, but it seems like <laughs> most algorithms, in my, in my research, uh, I've seen that most algorithms focus on evictions, correct? If you, if you look up cache algorithms, you'll get LRU, starting with LRU, all the way to LIRS. Uh, but most of these algorithms are focusing on optimizing the space, uh, optimizing the memory. So 
like most closure engineers, so I've been doing it for I've been doing closure for a little less than three years, and um, I always ask the question, how do you decouple things? And it looks like most caching solutions, and I'm talking about application level, at the library level, we couple eviction and invalidation, right? If you look at core.cache, there is an evict function. Look at any Java library, any Java enterprise caching to, um, you know, name your favorite language, you couple both. Why are they coupled? Guesses? I think he has a, he has a point. Uh, you, one is dependent on the other, but but my point here is that, oops, my point here is um, eviction seems to be, if you forget the fact that memory is limited, imagine memory is unlimited, eviction cannot exist without invalidation. Uh, I did put a star because that is actually not true, but if you think of it this way, invalidation has the property, and eviction is the after effect. Correct. So why not decouple? So this is the sort of insight we had, and I'm sure there's, there's a lot of people who have done this in different uh, layers, but, but I think uh, our premise is that if we decouple, I think we might have a m little more control. And, and by that, I mean, you're going back to that question, what time, uh, the question is not what time the function is called, if you remember the previous slide, T1 to Tn, it is what is the relative time to the inv invalidation request? It boils down to time. And there goes my third one, is it seems like naming is what couples them both. So why not put the time in the cache name itself, in the cache key name itself? So this is how our cache key name looks like. We actually have a cache name, a UID, which is our user ID. Uh, we have a cache version, which we will see in a bit. And the notion of logical timestamp. Now, if you've seen the, from the first slide, I did start that temporal locality is where the focus is, but we don't want to keep capturing every instant of every user request, because that is a really hard way to solve time uh, problem in a concurrent access. Instead, we will have a logical timestamp, which is essentially a counter, an atomic counter, to saying that if X number of requests happen, if there's an invalidation, the counter is pumped. It's a really simple concept. We have seen this in many, many applications, um, an atomic clock, essentially. Instead, our atomic clock is logical. And the other key insight is that our keys, we don't know the keys yet. We have to know the logical timestamp to get the keys. So the keys essentially are immutable. What that means is that auto, it, it, you get invalidation for sort of free because each key is now mapped to a generation. That, and when every time there's an invalidation that happens, that generation is no longer valid. Therefore, our key, cache keys are essentially you know, providing us a small snapshot of the caches. So uh, going back to that, uh, it seems like our focus should be on invalidation, and naming gives us that, uh, gives us that access. And let's see how that works. Uh, in our case, we have three, uh, three essential caches, which is local, remote, and generational. And I, I want to talk about generational first, because that's what I introduced. Um, Generation, uh, so level cache, in level cache, this is how it looks like. It's actually a just simple map. So we start with a name, uh, we start with a version, and we start with dependencies. And in the dependencies, uh, you will see that the cache is dependent on other caches. This is just like any, um, any concept you've seen where you know, services are dependent on other services, or even components are dependent on other components. Same concept, except you actually focus on the, the cache query itself. Right? Each function that is surfaced as a cache is now having these segments. Uh, so the key here is the compute function. The compute function is responsible for taking, um, it's, it's an opaque function. It returns, let's say, a t, some value, that can get serialized and deserialized. That's all it is. So if we have a definition of our cache, we have dependencies, and we'll see how these tie together. Uh, have you see, as you've seen in the beginning, uh, a user's transaction is essentially our entire focus of the app, right? We surface up 
the user's you know, transaction history. We do some predictions. We, uh, we, we have some data science algorithms that run. Everything goes through the transaction. So we're essentially caching all of these segments. And the dependency actually does not, is not that fun because it ends up being a DAG. And uh, if, you, if you've seen systems where services are uh, dependent on other services, you can apply the same logic here, right? So in our case, you can look at this balance projection over here. That actually depends on other, other uh, cache segments. So how do you compute a cache that is at the bottom of the DAG and, that, and then other caches have to be computed before that? It is a tough problem, right? So let's see how that works. Um, turns out uh, we didn't want to solve, when we started off this, we didn't want to solve the cache DAG uh, automatically, so we actually hand-coded that order. It's an ordered list at this point. Um, there are no branches. So as you can see, uh, the entire list is listed one by one. So if you have to invalidate full funds, as you can see over here, we just invalidate the rest. It's a fairly simple idea, but uh, when we have time, we would probably make this more automated. Use something like Stuart Sierra's component. Uh, which does dependencies much, much better. Um, and I'll see at the end uh, how that, that might work. Uh, the dependencies are, are essentially hierarchical. Uh, these are some points um, that, um, that I left in the slide, just in case you wanted to know at the end. But the most important thing is that we, don't, we have a compile time check that sees that these dependencies are, don't end up in circular order. Um, we'll see that in a bit as well. And that's, that's the, it's a single function we can validate that if our caches are you know, perhaps not written well, the dependencies, we actually have a validation thrown at the end, uh, at the beginning of the app. But this is my favorite part, uh, which is the generational cache. So as I said, there's a core cache logic that is pure closure, has no dependencies on anything else, including our own apps, uh, apps APIs. In that core cache, there is an immutable key that is tied to how values in the cache are produced. And there's DynamoDB. Uh, we're just using that to store our uh, logical timestamp. You could replace that with anything else, any data store. It is important to store the cache key because it has to be atomic and persistent. Uh, it's the only way we can actually see the generational cache. Maybe it prevents race conditions. Uh, I don't know, but we might, <laughs> we, we might want to think like that. Uh, the next step is that the logical timestamps start at one, and they get atomically incremented, uh, as I just mentioned. And we have uh, several API boxes that actually query these caches. And uh, of course, uh, there's a mesh. Uh, we'll see the memcache part in a bit. Uh, we also have queues that refill the cache every, uh, in our case, we have every 24 hours. We also have some properties which, some services that uh, check if the cache is filled every three hours. Uh, but at this point, there is no external storage. This was how we started off two and a half years ago. We actually used D Dynamo as our cache storage engine. That was a bad idea. <laughs> that, that costed us, ten, uh, I think, close to $10,000 a month, and uh, nobody wants that, right? So, th so you will see in a bit why, how we moved away from Dynamo and actually used memcache. Uh, but as you can see, most of the cache logic was pure closure there was no dependency on even Dynamo, for that matter. We were just storing it as a data storage. Uh, as far as race conditions, uh, as I mentioned, if you just invalidate the cache, we actually increment the logical timestamp. So that gets, that is how we invalidate our cache. Uh, the old generation will still have access to it, but that is such a, a small time span that it, that it doesn't matter for us. So next step is memcache. So as you can see, there has to be a delegation uh, because because we didn't want to tie uh, the storage provider to our cache logic. So we used uh, Sort Sierra's component, uh, which kind of played well in this case because we can now delegate uh, all the storage co uh, storage access patterns inside that, along with metrics. Uh, anything that you don't want to deal with uh, at your core logic. Um, so therefore, and there's also serialization that is involved uh, with memcache. Uh, we use protocol buffers and gzip that. And there are two questions that come up when you're doing this, um, which is 
when should I add and when is it full? There are no right answers. I would say that uh, it depends again. Uh, the, the worst answer that I hear, and, and unfortunately I have the same answer, is it depends because you have, we have to keep calibrating our API boxes, right? If, if, if it is getting too full, then you might want to check, is it because of queue service? Because typically you're, you're backed by a queue service. Um, the, the one thing that we don't want to do is keep refilling the caches. Uh, we do, I, did want to, I did mention this earlier that we have API boxes, but the one thing that we do is that we pre-fill every user's cache on load. What that means is when an app is, when, when someone logs in, every data segment they need for the transaction is actually pre-computed. This is important because that's the fastest way to actually load stuff. Uh, but at the same time, the, the trick here is to not load everything at the same time because your CPU cycles are going to be busy. So there's always a trade-off balance there. Um, the thing with memcache is that there, it isn't the memcache issue itself. It depends on your, um, the data payloads. Uh, we actually have data payloads that are one MB. Uh, imagine a user having last three years you know, transaction history from their bank accounts, and if you actually compress all of them, it still is about a about 700 KB to 1 MB. And gzipping that itself takes a lot of time. Uh, we're, we're talking about all the users, right? So this is somewhere we, we, hit. Uh, we hit. We saw the performance hit. But I think Nippy was faster. Uh, it still wasn't that good. Um, that's when we went into the second level. Uh, I did mention there was a generational cache, local cache, and remote cache. Uh, what we saw was remote cache. And uh, because we had dependencies, and we were computing again and again and serializing again and again for each dependency, it made sense to cache something locally because we don't want to compute the same thing over and over within the same uh, compute cycle. So um, core cache is fairly simple. Uh, it is a co closure contrib, and it has a lot of good implementations. Um, the best part is that SpyCache, which is the library we use for memcache, already has a core cache baked in. Uh, so this is how the core cache protocol is. Uh, what we will see here is just a hit and a miss. We are not using the others as well as lookup. But I hope that makes sense um, in the next uh, couple slides because I think a lot of it came together at that point for us at least. So as you can see now, the component is getting busier. Uh, we had the core log logic over here and we introduced the memcache which is separating the storage provider now the component is also des deciding, should I look at local, should I look at remote? And that is decoupled from the application uh, logic, which is doing invalidation and recalculation. And it's a plain re uh, write through and read through. So before uh, I wanna go to the next uh, slide, um, have you heard of all, about delays? Raise your hand if you're familiar with delays in uh, closure. Okay, that's good. Uh, this is based on a blog, and uh, we were kind of unsure whether to you know, buy more memcache clusters or you know, spend like a couple of weeks on like, tuning, and then we found this blog. I would say that a lot of it came together at this blog. I totally recommend this, uh, even if you're not doing cache. This is an excellent example of how Clojure actually provides small set of tools and not necessarily a package solution, but when you find the right hit, it actually is a sweet spot. And uh, in our case, delay was what, was what made the recomputation more efficient. And if you look at delay, it, even if you haven't heard of it, this is it. It is literally a Java, it, this is a Java implementation in the closure delay. And delay looks at, it has, it has a synchronized method for dereffing. And that's pretty much about it. And it is, only, it is guaranteed to r run only once, and any time any other person who derefs it gets the cached value. So in other words, it is, it is touted as a better memoize. And, and you have to read the blog to kind of slowly go through the entire delay versus feature versus promise. The way I understand it as a six-year-old usually is that delay is the smallest subset, future adds on top of delay, and promise is basically delivering a value to a future whereas delay is you're delivering the value but you're not computing it at that time. Uh, in other words, if you have a computation that is expensive and you want it to be synchronized and you, you want to actually execute it at a later point of time, delay is actually a good fit. So we have two functions 
so after, after all of this, we, we looked at how can we do our local cache to memcache lookup, because the whole problem boils down to the fact that we don't want to go to memcache if we have something in local cache. And in local cache, we have a big tag. That means that there are a lot of dependencies whose computations have to be traversed. And each, within each traversal, we want to make sure that that computation is not hitting again and again. So this is how it looks like. So our query cache is the API that is exposed uh, to all the rest of the services. The first step is we get the logical timestamp, and we get the compute key over here. And we have a recursive call to compute all the dependencies. And what, that, what I mean by that is a cache may have other dependencies that may have other dependencies. And the values that are computed, if you go bottom to up, ha must be passed to, to the, everyone who is computing it. Because otherwise, you'll be hitting the same value again and again, right? And the next step is we delay the recalculation. And the recalculation is essentially a single function that computes what is the value of this cache. But we don't want to calculate it at that point. We want to delay it. So we put it in a delay. And the third step is that is what we call gen cache. And in gen cache, we're saying uh, now cache component instance is an atom that holds uh, three keys. We'll see that in the next slide. Gen cache essentially is swapping the components, uh, the atoms uh, map. Uh, with this function called query through. And it's passing the delayed value, which is essentially saying, hey, take this recalculate computation, it is a delayed value. So we're passing delayed values, which is, which is one of the insights we had, that you can actually pass a delayed value. And then we give a serialized and deserialized functions to that. And we return the result, we deref the result of this. I hope that this will make sense in the next slide. So the query through, which is getting um, the component, which is the atom, it has a memcache and a local cache. It did have the base key, and the value delay was the delayed re recalculation, right? So the first step it does is it will, it will say, hey, okay, someone is asking me, check this cache name, is it there or not? The first step it will do, obviously, is to look at local cache, right? So it will do a core cache lookup, which is the primitive in core cache protocol then it will put it into the cache hit, saying that it is, it is calculated. And we always put the result in the result key. Now, that atom has three keys, local cache, memcache, and result. The one who is derefing this will always look at the result. If it's not found, then we look at the memcache and return a delay of the memcache value. Now, this gets a little heavy here because we're talking about a delay that is that is being passed, and over here, we are delaying a memcache value, which is essentially looking up if that value exists in memcache or not. If it is not, then we miss, we do a cache miss. Because at this point, it's not in local, it is not in memcache, then we call the core cache saying, okay, this is a miss. Now, you do a value delay. Raise your hands if you, if this does not make sense, because I'm gonna raise my hand. When I saw this, it was like, okay, this is one of those moments in closure land where I'm frustrated, or probably lisp land, I am completely frustrated, I don't get it, but then I get it, and then I walk away. And I will say when I got it, is that this is the value delayed derefing. Now, if you remember the previous slide, I am passing the delayed value, the delayed recalculation value to the query through, correct? And over here, I am derefing that delayed value, which is wrapped in a delay. This is the beauty of delay. You can pass a delay and deref it into, in a wrapper that is a delay. Right? Hold on to this in a bit. So I, now, if it is now that we found it in, uh, we, found, we didn't find it in memcache, we hit it, right? We get the value and then we, we deref the value. But again, notice this, there's a delay, we're derefing the value. And then I merge it, and I put the result in memcache delay. Now if you've noticed in the past slide, we're returning to the API provider. Now this is the single function that is called by all the APIs. It gets the result, 
and the result is always going to be the value that is computed either from local cache or memcache, which means that the API does not care where it came from. It might come from local cache, it might come from memcache, and if there are 10 concurrent users actually requesting this, the first one is only going to calculate that the nine other requests will get the same cache value. And this was, to me, that was the best part. Now we saw the issue that there might be hundreds of requests val uh, requesting the cache value, and if it is in local cache, it is guaranteed that even if we have a complex DAG, it is only, within that computation, it's only going to compute once. Before this, it was computing every single time, and that is not fun. It's like taking 20 seconds, even though it is hitting the same for the same request. And I thought that was really cool, because uh, we did not do any locks here. There is no primitives other than the single delay. And I thought that was, that was really good. Um, I would say I probably understand 99% of it. Uh, it would be sad if I said I understood everything because there's a lot still uh, that I'm learning. But the best way I've found how to understand this, how to understand delay and delay our computation is like how we box things. And this is an abstract notion of how I understood is that you can wrap the recompute delay and then keep passing it into memcache delay and the final result. And you're essentially delaying that value and finally the result is being deref. Um, I call that delay the recalculation. So in, in summary, what we have is uh, cache logic, which is pure, pure closure. We have a cache component that is decoupling the lookup through the local cache provider or the remote cache provider. The local cache provider is using delays so that the com computation of, in the entire DAG is only done once and it also making sure that the concurrent access is you know, to its best. There is no guarantees yet. There, is, there might be still some race condition, but it at least tries the 99.99%, I would say. And then we still use Dynamo or an, any external storage provider for the get, get logical user timestamp. And going back to the first slide, this kind of made sense because now we have a physical cache and now we have many logical caches and if you have, you know, if this is, we're running the service on about a dozen API boxes, each API box has its own local cache, right? And uh, the key here is that we don't, we want the local cache to be really, really fast because what's the point of having a local cache? We don't serialize or deserialize in local cache, but we do serialize in the memcache part, which, which takes a little bit of fit, but, but that's okay. Um, so, yeah, this is, the summary of what, uh, what we have at this point. It is not perfect, but it gives, gives us that nice separation of local to remote, and not, we don't have to worry about hitting memcache all the time. Uh, there are some gotchas, uh, especially the queues can be backed up, um, and uh, sometimes profiling could help. Uh, there are some other uh, interesting facts. Um, as I mentioned, we have several API boxes. Uh, which means there's obviously a load balancer in front, and this is how it looks like. So there are many requests coming into the load balancer, and now they go to individual API boxes, and each box will have a local cache. Now that is the fastest part. It usually is about a couple milliseconds. That is really fast, but here's a problem. Can someone see a problem here? Especially with the load balancer hitting the local cache. In terms of, yes. So he said that coherency will the same, will the client get the same local cache when they make the request? That is the problem. So, so our load balancer is stateless. We did not put sticky sessions yet, um, and we're still looking into it. But the consensus is that making the load balancer smart is probably not a good idea. Uh, but there is an issue where if the same user request makes multiple requests, it will hit in the other API box, and they may not have a local cache. The same local, it's the same hit they had in the previous request. So in that case, it will go to memcache, and memcache is anywhere from 80 to 100x hit. In this case, it happens to be, you know, 100 milliseconds. The best case scenario is like less than 50 milliseconds, but, it, but if you take the network load, it might actually bump up. And if it's not found in memcache, then you have to go to Dynamo, and that's really expensive. Uh, but that's something we're, we're okay 
to live with. Uh, we haven't discovered uh, a better solution yet, but that's a known issue. Uh, always watch your dashboards. Uh, I especially look at the evictions. Uh, it just looks like this, uh, which means it's busy, and that's that's a decent sign. And um, I didn't mention the component part. Uh, the component is, is a pretty busy guy, does like all the machinery. Uh, one of the things you might wonder, um, how do you know which, how many hits or miss you have? And, and the nice part about component is, is that you can wrap all your calls with these loggers and timers. And I find it a really useful pattern. Uh, and we do that a lot. Uh, this is a metrics drop visit library. Um, it's, it's a pure Java one. We just wrap it in Clojure, and it's, it's pretty good. Uh, there are other uh, fun parts about performance uh, that cache, caches doesn't have to be with, with those two uh, things that I mentioned. It also boils down to things like, do you know about sequences? I don't know. I'm still learning. And the, the fun part about these are that you actually end up looking at the core Clojure data structures, and some of the fun parts uh, looks like this. Does anyone know, or do you know what is wrong with this function? If I didn't tell you what the context of who's calling this function is. This is our, like, part of our production code, and it's, a, it's, it's literally filtering with a bunch of conditions, and cards is a sequence. So this is a sequence, and it's filtering that sequence. Uh, we all write this kind of code, right? We, we pass collections along, we pass sequences along, and we filter them. And the issue with this, without knowing the context, is that it can be slow. And in our case, it was actually really, really slow because we were calling this from a reducer. And sequences are not, like if you have 5,000 elements in that in which we had for a user, uh, we have to sort them and actually sort them in reverse order. And so we started using rseq. So we actually factored out this function, instead of returning cards, we actually had a function that reversed the cards and did an RSeq. That was like close to like 30 times faster. So there are little things like this that you will know, and I would urge to, you know, us to profile. We use uh, your kit, uh, which, is, which is a pretty solid profiler. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's surprising to see that you know, we use maps and sequences all the time, but when it, when it you know, boils down to the basics, like they are not always the best solution. Clojure has a lot of lower level primitives. And I urge you guys to like look into that because sometimes it, it is worth it. Like in our case, it was worth it. Um, there is a, we're still refactoring this code. Hopefully, in, we would like to open source it. Uh, and my favorite part is that the entire caching logic is abstracted away in a single function. And uh, this is another part of the excitement I have is like when I look at things, like other in my past, I've done some caching solutions uh, in the Java land and in some Python land, and I, I found the abstractions uh, not like very limiting. Uh, I had to look at a lot of functions to, to understand how caching works, and even though this was a long, convoluted way to get into, hey, this is what we got. At the end of it, it is just a single function, and it reads like this: um, we take a you know UID and a timestamp and a time zone and we get the cache name, everything else is hidden from the APIs, from, the, uh, from our queues. And I, I like this. I kind of like how to reason a cache without knowing how it is implemented. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, it is surprisingly uh, spare. Um, I would say 600 lines of code for the entire caching. It's literally three files. It started out with one file, um, and then we split into three files because we split into memcache and local cache as well, and uh, one protocol. And then the, the nice thing is that we're now able to look at cache as its own living entity. The cache has a name. It has a version. Uh, the version essentially, uh, what the version means is that if, if you change the definition of the cache compute, we just bump the version, which means that the cache logic could be updated over time, and then the old cache still will be valid, and the new, cache, new, the new guys with the key will be looking at the new one. Uh, so there were we decoupled serialize, deserialize, and compute. And I think uh, that is interesting. I've seen other libraries do that, uh, but going through that on your own, I think, is fun. I think the part of 
a lot of fun is that you know, we have a, like, a solid team, and uh, Gregor, who was one of the, fir the first engineers in the team, he wrote the first version. And then I came in, we did some refactoring on it with Memcache, and then we had another engineer who did a lot of performance, Gregory. So the, at the end of, you know, if you look at three years, the whole code base moved, but we didn't add a lot. We, we actually refactored a bit, and we're sort of in a happy place. And the lesson I have for myself, uh, and I hope it is useful, is that you can, you can do a lot of these things when you build something homegrown based on the data patterns that you understand in your cache. And uh, we're, we're quite pleased with that. Um, and uh, the best part, uh, the best part is that, so I was working on a, on a sprint where we were, had to do a lot of predictions on the transactions as well as having a completely new interface. It was all done, and we were about to release. We had a couple of days, same story, you've all heard it, and then it was slow. And so we looked back into how can we make this feature called cards uh, faster, and it turned out we had to go back and add one map entry and one function. And when we saw that, that is when we kind of like took a break and you know, went, in, you know, went into the video game room and then said, okay, it's worth it. And having those little moments, I think, is helpful because uh, you kind of see the whole thing coming together at the end. So there are a lot of things that, uh, that are not perfect, um, especially the DAG, as you've seen in the first part. The DAG is literally an ordered list. Uh, it would be really nice to have a library that generates that, to have dependency explicitly mentioned. Uh, if you've seen Stuart Sierra's talk yesterday, he does mention about component. I think a lot of goodness uh, could be used from that library. Uh, we actually are using it, but not for dependency. Uh, one good idea is to take our cache map and actually use each of those map as a cache component. So instead of a big giant map with you know, 20 or a couple dozen entries that we have, we can use each entry as a cache component and have cache dependent on each other. So that's a nice idea. Uh, we also can do some work on the optimizing the load cache and maybe async computation. Um, I haven't thought about it, uh, but we're working on an async library, so maybe we could use that library's primitives in our compute function. Uh, the key here is that anything could be sw swapped out. Because we decouple compute, serialize, and deserialize, it is possible to swap out things, and I think that's, uh, that's a nice property to have. Uh, so that's the team I would like to thank. Uh, a lot of the work goes to Gregor. Uh, he did the original code. So when I first came in, I saw, like, hey, there's like 20,000 lines of code. Who's, who wrote this? And he was like, okay, that's me. And that's when I knew that, okay, this is, I have a lot of work ahead. Uh, and that's the fun part of being in closure teams because you look around and then there are just like three or four people in that team. And to be part of that team is empowering, I think. You learn a lot. And I've learned a lot, uh, for sure. Uh, and Gregory Sizemore, he, he helped with the performance part. I think when I first looked at the, the delay blog, I, it wasn't quite apparent for me. Uh, then he sat down and he actually implemented the first part, and then I re-looked into what he'd done. It totally made sense. Uh, so big thanks to him as well, and of course the rest of the team. But there's one person I want to thank. Uh, his, his name is Noodles. Um, and uh, I, I know it's, it's actually very serious. Uh, uh, <laughs> The, the thing with, uh, if you worked in, this has nothing to do with caching, but if you worked in, uh, in teams that are really small, and especially in a team that has that big a code base, it is important for the tech lead to drive a direction, have a set of qualities, right? I think we all agree to that. You can't just check in code in Clojure because Clojure has a sense of style, and you know, there, there's, there's a lot of careful, uh, uh, carefulness that you have to take care of. It's not like other languages. Closure has to be a little more like, um, no, I, I wouldn't use the word handheld, but it has to be taken with care. So I learned a lot with GitHub reviews, uh, PR requests. And I would like to thank Noodles because Noodles is the be best, worst PR reviewer in the world. And uh, yeah, it's a big thanks because, uh, because without Noodles, uh, that, is, that is Gregor's cat, by the way. Uh, I don't think I would have learned that much. And I urge all of us, uh, hopefully, that if we're working on teams that are small um, and with different skill levels, uh, PR re pull requests are actually really useful. Uh, it's, it's really useful. Um, on a final note, I want to end with this. Um, 
I've been doing closure for about, I would say two and a half years, though I wrote my first Hello World about three years ago, and I quit my job after that. I <laughs> because I thought, okay, if I can do a Hello World and a, re and a simple REST server in about you know, half an hour, I probably should like, quit my job. So um, a lot happened then, and, I've, and last year I went to Japan. Uh, I was in Tokyo. And uh, if you've been to Tokyo, you know of, of a lot of good things in Tokyo. There is one great thing, uh, of many things, uh, is that the subway system, right? Their subway system is, is, is an excellent example of a complex system that is simple, efficient, and precise. But I'm not talking about the subway system. I was actually sitting there with my camera, uh, and then I saw this lady holding this little box with the cat. And uh, I remember at that point that my writing teacher uh, back in my MFA days, uh, fiction that is, um, said that you might be working in a novel for like three years, five years, 10 years, and you will be rewriting because the process of creativity is to revisit and revisit. And it is frustrating. You will bang your head. I actually banged my head for six months on closure uh, before I finally thought I should take it seriously. And the best part is once you kind of get it, I think we all share that, right? I, think, I don't think we will be here without that. Once you get it, there is this moment of silence. And that's what I found, is that that's it. And I find that once in you know, three days, maybe three months, and that's what I'm after. And I do want to share this because I'm still, in, find, I'm still trying to find that. And it's worth it because closure gives you that small, small cherishes, I would say. For me, delay was one for sure, uh, and, and a few other things like local cash. Uh, when you find that, it's worth. I, th I think a language is worth learning for that. So I just want to end that because, hey, otherwise, I would be back in my dark ages. Um, I would not mention the language, but we know where that is. <laughs> right. Well, so thank you. I think I have about five minutes uh, if you have any questions. Yes. Oh, it's just like one file. We just, uh, because we have it backed with a protocol, we just have to switch our data storage provider. So his question was what happens if you switch memcache with Redis? Uh, I didn't want to focus on why memcache, why Redis. Memcache is just simple for us. But we use memcache as a pure data storage provider that gives you eviction, a solid eviction for free. And we didn't want to deal with eviction, as I mentioned in my first slide. So it's simply a matter of switching and writing the gets and puts. Any other question? I guess not. All right, thank you again.